Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Alex White. I'm delighted to have been asked to chair this afternoon's uh, event, which is the second presentation of the 2022 Environmental Resilience Lecture Series co-organized by the IIEA and the Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA. And I'd like to recognize at the outset and thank at the EPA for their sponsorship of this series. Very much hoping to uh, hear from them in the course of our uh, uh, event this afternoon. Um, and we look, forward to, we look forward to that. But thank you, all, as always, to the EPA for their support and sponsorship. Uh, today, we are delighted to be joined by Professor Joseph Allen, all the way from Boston. Um, I'd like to thank him for being so generous uh, with his time to speak to us this afternoon. Joseph G. Allen is director of the Healthy Buildings Program and an associate professor at Harvard's T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Before joining the faculty at Harvard, he spent several years in the private sector at leading teams of scientists and engineers to investigate and resolve hundreds of indoor environmental quality uh, issues, including sick buildings, so-called sick buildings, cancer clusters, uh, and biological chemical hazards. His academic research focuses on the critical role the indoor built environment plays in our overall health. One of the world's leading experts on healthy buildings, Dr. Allen is a regular keynote speaker and advises leading global companies. He's the co-author uh, of Healthy Buildings, Healthy Buildings, which is a reasonable title for a book, given his, um, his area of interest. The title of Professor Allen's presentation this afternoon, <clears throat> Tackling Air Pollution. He's going to speak to us for about 20 minutes, after which we'll move to the uh, Q&A session. You'll be able to join that discussion using the Q&A function on Zoom, which you should be able to uh, find e easily enough on your screen. Feel free to send in your questions throughout the session as they occur to you. We always make that point at the outset. If a question occurs, don't wait until you think now is time for questions. Just put it into the uh, system and we'll have it there ready to go uh, when we come to that part of the event. Please identify yourself, if you wouldn't mind, and your affiliation uh, to any organization, if, uh, if indeed you have one. Today's presentation, to remind you, is and the Q&A uh, are both on the record. And you can also join us on Twitter, by the way, if you're minded uh, to do so. I can see on my screen that, thankfully, we are uh, joined by uh, our good friend and colleague, Dr. Michal Lahan, Director of the EPA's Office of Radiation Protection and Environmental Monitoring. And I'm going to invite Michal now, if I may, to offer some opening remarks this afternoon. Michal, you're more than welcome. Uh, thank you, Alex. That's great. And uh, just I'd like to also echo that welcome to this uh, second event in the, the Environmental Resilience Lecture Series, which is co-organised by ourselves and the IIEA. I mean, you've mentioned there that Professor Allen, you know, will be highlighting the strategies today in, in combating air pollution in, in indoor environments, the debilitating uh, health effects of poor air quality and substandard housing conditions are often overlooked, but indoor air pollution leads to millions of premature deaths every year. And, you know, he'll be outlining the key findings, for, as you mentioned from his book, Healthy Buildings how indoor spaces drive uh, performance and productivity, which was recognized as best book of the year in Fortune magazine and the New York Times for two consecutive years. So I suppose from our perspective, the EPA, we don't monitor indoor air quality, um, but we have established a national, uh, extensive national ambient uh, air quality monitoring network for outdoor air quality. And this network will be completed this year and consist of 116 stations located right across Ireland. And, and in addition, we've improved both the availability and the accessibility of air quality information from the network. Uh, and thus, and in association with the health service executive, you know, developed and generated this national air quality index for health. Um, separately and, and, and linked though, is uh, through an EU funded project called uh, Life Emerald. The EPA is developing models based on the monitoring data that we're collecting from our network. <clears throat> The Variety Irish Public with a three-day forecast of ambient air quality, enabling the public to make informed choice about their daily activities. And now CAST, which is providing modelled um, air quality information to fill in between the stations that are on the network, and historical maps to give detailed information in local areas. So following the success of a, of a, of a citizen science project called Clean Air Together in Dublin, which had over 
a thousand citizens monitoring air quality, in this case a traffic related pollutant, uh, around their homes, offices and schools. The EPA with Antashka have recently launched the Clean Air Together in Cork and we've had a great response for the public there with over 900 participants uh, taking part and they've just begun that monitoring now. And for me, you know, this is all about, yes, it's about collecting valuable information about air pollution, but it's also about getting the people and the public engaged and involved around air quality and air quality issues. So we know the link, you know, that the link between solid fuel combustion for home heating in our towns and villages has a neg and the negative effects of the fine particulate matter PM2.5 in ambient air is well understood and it's been highlighted by ourselves in many successful reports over the years. The current understanding of those impacts at low levels as well of this pollutant PM2.5 has also informed the World Health Organization to reduce and significantly reduce its annual ambient air quality guidance level. And I think in addition to this, this is where today really is important, I think for us and for everybody's interest in air quality, there's a growing volume of research and the impact of solid fuel heating systems on our indoor air quality. So I'm really looking forward to listening more about the impacts of air pollution on our indoor spaces and then the strategies to combat air pollution indoor environments to make our homes, our schools and our offices healthy places to live, study and work in. So I now invite Professor Allen to deliver his address. Well, thank you. That was a really nice introduction, and um, uh, I'm looking forward to, to the conversation. It's quite an honor to be uh, to be invited to, to um, hopefully set the stage for a rich conversation and question and answer session on the topic of environmental resilience and specifically the role of buildings. Right, as we think about uh, outdoor air pollution, of course, the dirty secret of outdoor air pollution is it penetrates indoors, and because we spend the vast majority of our life indoors. Even as that outdoor air pollution concentration is reduced as it comes inside, the majority of your exposure to outdoor air pollution occurs indoors. That should that does surprise a lot of people to hear that. The majority of your exposure to outdoor air pollution can occur indoors. Uh, my goals for this session is to kind of set the stage for a rich discussion, but also place buildings at the center of a lot of these problems we're talking about. Buildings consume um, uh, forty percent of global energy in some cities. It's seventy or higher. Seventy percent of global energy. They're at the center of our climate crisis. Uh, we spend majority of our time indoors, and we see an indoor uh, how the indoor environment influences our health. And um, because buildings, as I hope to show, are at the center of the problems, that means they're at the center of the solution set, or they have to be, as we think about long-term climate mitigation adaptation, and also healthier indoor environments. So I'd like to start my presentations with a little thought experiment, asking people um, what you know about healthy living. So if you were to ask a general audience, what do you know about healthy living? And also, how do you know what constitutes a healthy lifestyle? If you ask that question, you're going to get good answers around things like this. I know I should exercise every day. That's good for my health. I know I should eat healthy, and we know what healthy foods are, we know what unhealthy foods are. We know that outdoor air pollution is bad for us. We know we shouldn't smoke cigarettes. And so how do we know all of this? And I'd argue that we have much of the knowledge of what the public understands constitutes healthy living comes from these great human epidemiological cohort studies. They follow tens of thousands of people for years, decades, and look at their lifestyle, environmental factors, genetic factors, and, and health outcomes. And if you look at all of these great studies though, you see a glaring hole. None of them talk about the role of the building. And because we don't look at the building in these great big studies, these long-term cohort studies, we have a knowledge gap. And the public therefore has the knowledge gap. So in its place, what we have is a relatively small field of indoor air quality scientists relatively under, well, underfunded, grossly underfunded compared to other aspects of, uh, of environmental health or public health, yet it has an outsized impact on our health. And we don't actually have to go much farther than look right at what happened with COVID and why, and why this was such a problem. Besides being novel to our immune systems, we had a failure to recognize that the building plays a critical role in keeping us safe from this respiratory virus and others. 
I've been writing about this from the beginning of the pandemic. Here's an article in the New York Times, March 2020, placing buildings at the center of our response to the COVID-19 crisis. Yet, if you recall that time period, much of the guidance, and it still persists today, was around fomite transmission or shared surfaces or droplet transmission. And this idea that if you stay just two meters or six feet from somebody, you're going to be okay. And we were cleaning our deep cleaning buildings and, and people were, didn't want to handle the mail or, or be careful with groceries. We fundamentally missed that this virus is an airborne virus. Nearly all spread happening indoors. So spread through the air, all spread indoors, nearly all. So what does that mean? Well, buildings had to be the centerpiece of our response. And for much of the world missed this for a year or more. So I don't want to dwell on COVID, but I want to talk about um, four fundamental shifts that are coming out of COVID as it relates to our buildings. The first is this. As we are here, uh, not together, but you're all in your, your room watching this, wherever you are, when you're with other people, you're out at school, the office, the grocery store, we are constantly emitting, emitting respiratory aerosols. These aerosols are all different sizes. The majority, if someone's infectious, the majority of that virus travels in the smaller aerosols that travel well beyond two, feet, two meters. And this is a work we did with the New York Times, visualizing respiratory aerosols in a classroom. Same thing would hold in any office, conference room, bus, airplane. Very quickly, you see that the aerosols of everyone in the room are mixing and they're traveling beyond this. Uh, they fill up the room. So we have all spread happening indoors. We have aerosols that travel beyond two meters and a buildup of aerosols in underventilated or underfiltered spaces. So the first key takeaway is that the scientific and medical literature is being rewritten. Really, it was decades of, of over-focused on droplet transmission, these, these large droplets that fall out of the air within two meters. That's being rewritten in the top medical journals, New England Journal of Medicine, The Lancet, JAMA, Global scientists agreeing on this. And it's this principle that as you have an infectious person, relatively quickly, these aerosols travel very quickly beyond two meters or six feet, fill up an entire room. And the concentration of infectious particles or viral uh, particles in, uh, in the air is dependent upon the size of the room, number of people infected, and ventilation and filtration. And with relatively simple strategies, Increasing ventilation, enhancing filtration. You can decrease the concentration. So that's number first fundamental takeaway is this <clears throat> airborne transmission being recognized as the dominant mode of transmission. We should have gotten this right in year one, took several years to get there. <clears throat> Second key takeaway that says the focus on buildings now is not going away. We have a very savvy public now Everyone is, an infect is very knowledgeable on infectious disease, infectious disease transmission. I always say my neighbor now talks to me about filtration and ventilation. Here's something I pulled um, from the, a website called Glassdoor, which is where people talk about their jobs. Usually, they talk about salary and culture and what job title they have and what the work is like. Well, they're also talking about their building. In my book, I talk about it as your employees are interviewing your building. So I pulled one that I thought was really quite interesting. This company now has this statement linked to their company forever, where someone says, how is being in this office any different than being on a virus-infected cruise ship for eight hours a day, five days a week? So employees are recognizing that the building is playing a role in their health. You now have a widespread awareness of this. You have an entire media and social media ecosystem focused on this. That's not going away anytime soon. And in fact, you have people now monitoring indoor air quality and reporting on it. I showed this on CNN, this monitor. I have several monitors behind me right now. They're relatively low cost. And people are sharing this. The same device now that used to be available only to scientists, people can go in and they measure in the school, the classroom, in a coffee shop, and they report on this in social media. So hyper aware public that is now has the tools to measure and verify indoor air quality. Okay, third, it has finally been recognized that buildings are central to this fight. 
I'm, I'm proud to have been an advisor to the White House for the past year in the, U in the U.S. As of February 2020, President Biden elevated buildings, this clean air and buildings challenge, elevated it on par with vaccines, therapeutics, testing in the pandemic response. That is a major shift and it will lead to a continued long-term um, shift. And here's the what's coming next. The problem has been that you have buildings built designed for low ventilation rates. This is a figure showing a hundred year history of ventilation rates. I'm not gonna go through all the detail, but I wanna point this out. The dotted red line is the level at which we knew a hundred years ago was sufficient or helpful in reducing or mitigating infectious disease transmission indoors. In the past hundred years, globally, we have decreased the ventilation rate. So is it any surprise? We have a novel virus that's spread through the air nearly entirely indoors, meets a building stock that is underventilated. We choked off the air supply in our buildings. These respiratory aerosols build up. And if you look at every single super spreader event, you'll find that same thing. Time indoors, underventilated, underfiltered. This is by design. We designed our buildings incorrectly for the past, really been the, four, the past 40 years in particular, we've decreased our ventilation rate. What to do about this? I want to highlight a report from the Lancet COVID-19 Commission. I chair the Lancet's task force on safe work, safe school, and safe travel. We put out a report just a couple of weeks ago trying to simplify this. The first four strategies every building should pursue. One, give your building a tune-up, just like you do for your car. We do this every year for our car. Buildings, similarly, start to perform worse over time. We need to give them a tune-up to bring them back to where they should be performing. Maximize ventilation rates. Upgrade your filtration deploy portable air cleaners where necessary. That's the third big change coming. The fourth is this. This issue of COVID and ventilation air quality has now opened a much more broad conversation about all the factors in the indoor environment that influence health. So here's a report my Harvard team put out called The Nine Foundations of a Healthy Building, talking about water quality, lighting, biophilic design, the influence of dust and mold, and acoustical quality and thermal conditions. And what I've seen is that the entry point to be thinking differently about our buildings was COVID, ventilation, air quality. And now major multinational organizations, companies, the White House in the US are rethinking our entire strategy around buildings and what, how we can improve the condition for everybody indoors with a wider lens on what constitutes healthy buildings. I tell you, I have more content but I'm right at 820. And I wanna be sure we have a lot of time for question and answer and discussion. But some of the other things, maybe I'll just tee up before I finish here, is that there is a great convergence happening. So you had a green buildings movement focused on energy efficiency and climate. You have a smart buildings movement talking about sensors and smart buildings and, and maybe indoor air quality. You have these safety professionals and the safety and security community over here. Well, there's this great convergence happening now that has to happen and it's converging around healthy buildings because we have to design buildings that are both optimized for human health and safety and comfort without ignoring the building, building's contribution to climate change. And there's been this false dichotomy presented for decades that we have to have either a healthy building, higher ventilation rates, use more energy, or energy efficiency, we choke off the air supply and have an unhealthy building. That's false. And there are many examples of how we can actually optimize both, optimize indoor health while making sure we're protecting health beyond the four walls of the building through better energy decisions. So a lot to talk about on the climate side, sustainability side, healthy materials, the business case for healthy buildings, but I wanna see what you all wanna talk about. And I'll say this last thing before we get to question and answer. I wanna wrap it up on a, on, a, on a high note here. Like I said, that buildings are the center of all these problems. That means they're the part, they're center to the solution set. This is not just a, we don't know what to do. We actually have the tools available to us. And nothing less than this is at stake. The decisions we make today regarding our buildings determines our collective health now and for generations. That is said without exaggeration. 
So I want to thank you for letting me open up with just a few comments, hopefully to see the nice conversation here. And I'm looking forward to what questions and comments um, you all have. Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, in fact, you you did a lot better than 20 because, of course, you you, you could have you could have taken a few more minutes because you were we were giving you credit for the fact that our my, my introduction and Michal's introduction were there as well. So we're only just up on 20 past. And our people, I'm sure, are very interested, but they're a little slow coming with their questions, but we've got some already. One thing that occurred to me, I just ask you, um, and you, you did an interesting contextual uh, reference at the outset. So during COVID, so much of what the public health advice and the you know government advice had to do with proximity of individuals and all of the stuff that we were told and you know two meters and so forth. And whereas some so many other things were not in fact referenced or at least not referenced sufficiently early on or in a sufficiently robust manner that seemed to come into the debate although there were some voices perhaps some lone voices even here in ireland in fairness um who, who were saying that these were the, this was the agenda we should be looking at how much of that i wonder had to do with the kind of imperative of, of you know getting the advice out so that stuff that could be done quickly you know, stuff that pe people felt they could do quickly maybe was in the area of proximity and, you know, hand washing and all the hygiene. And that there may have been a perception, and really, I suppose this is my question, I wonder how, how fair is that perception that really the things we need to do with buildings are going to take longer. You know, they're going to take, they're much more, obviously at the design and build stage, well then that's that's to do with the design and build of, 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 a, of a building. And even some of the adjustments that might, might usefully be made to buildings they take time so i'm just wondering could you reflect for a few minutes on that whole business of like the kind of the the, the timelines for the sort of change that you say are most important perhaps mitigating against the public health advice is the fear that these things just take too long to rectify yeah i, I think you raise a couple of really good points there and um and, and we could talk about really what implementation looks like. I think that's fair. I tell you the first piece I wrote before that New York Times piece in March 2020 was early February 2020 in Financial Times. And it placed buildings at the forefront of the response, but acknowledged that there was a lot of uncertainty. And until that uncertainty was resolved, we should do a lot of everything, which meant, yeah, uh, hand washing makes a lot of sense. Distancing makes sense. There's and your cone of emissions is greater at close distance. So that makes sense. My real issue was that in the, in the totality of response in the early days and early months, in fact, the first year, the buildings were ignored. So it was very much a, we should do all this stuff. We tried everything, flatten the curve. We, we did a little everything, but we didn't do a little of everything when it came to ventilation and filtration. And my goal, like many scientists around the world, wasn't just me. There are plenty of voices out there trying to raise the alarm. I, I, co-authored a piece uh, to the WHO in science with an international group of colleagues all over the world, great scientists in the indoor air quality, raising the alarm on this, saying, well, this has to be part of the discussion. So it doesn't mean we don't do these other things. Masking was important. All this was very important until we resolved it, right? It's a precautionary principle. But we had evidence before SARS-CoV-2, for example, SARS-1, we had evidence was spread via the airborne route. So there was a lot of pushback that said, we don't really know. In fact, if you look at my field's scientific literature, we know that ventilation and filtration are key to reducing risk from influenza indoors and measles and TB and SARS-1. So we had plenty of, we, need, we had everything we needed to know. And if you look at that first report, it's very similar to this last report I mentioned, the first four. So what were the first things we were calling for? Better ventilation, better filtration and portable air cleaners. So let me address the implementation question. This is fair. Well, this is too expensive to overhaul my mechanical HVAC system, or it takes two years to do this, or it's too expensive. I don't think that's the case. One, on the expense side, there was, in the US, billions of dollars of stimulus globally, right? And, and we, the money was there uh, in terms of the response. It's also not expensive to, to do these fixes. And we also laid out a plan for what you can do in the short term while you address, let's say, the building level systems that might take longer. So, for example, written 50 articles in New York Times, Washington Post, in the US, saying we could deploy portable air cleaners. 
And I talked to all the manufacturers. They had the stock available. Portable air cleaner with a HEPA filter, you could put in this room or any room. And if you size it right, you can get four, five, six air changes per hour of clean air. Typical home in the US has half an air change per hour. Typical school has one and a half air changes. That's not a lot of turnover of air. With a simple plug and play device that costs a couple hundred dollars, let's take schools for classrooms, US dollars. That's a couple dollars per student per year. You could clean the air while you're thinking about how to spend stimulus dollars on an overhaul of your mechanical system if that's what's needed. So we had the short-term solutions while we could build to the longer-term uh, upgrades if needed. If you look at this first four report from the Lancet, I think it's really important because we got our, it's an expert uh, group of international scientists. And we got together and said, what are the four things if every building did? It's very doable, not expensive, and would really move the needle or you know, improve the condition of people in buildings, residential, offices, and factories. And the first one is really important, that tune-up idea. Because that's something every building can do right now. And buildings have are built to a design standard, not a performance standard. So they slip over time. And if we just brought buildings back up to the way they were performed, that improves empirically, studies have been shown, improves overall indoor air quality and saves energy, good for climate, and saves money. So it's actually a cost saving approach that improves indoor air quality. It's an absolute first thing that has to be done. And then you could think about how do I go above and beyond with filtration, ventilation, and use these portables as a stopgap measure. So it's, I don't think it's the case. I think it's a fair question. A lot of people have that question. I don't think healthy buildings are expensive. I don't think they're hard to do. And we have short-term things we can do to respond while we work on longer-term improvements. That's terrific. And so plenty of questions coming in now and plenty of interest. I'm going to put, I'm going to pitch two questions at you. First of all, uh, Theodorus van Veldhoven asks a simple and straightforward question. What's a cost-effective and easy measure that many people could take to improve the air quality of their own dwelling. Uh, and I suppose ally to that is the, the, the fact that so many of us are, are working from home so much as, as indeed uh, I am today, for example, and many people do. So um, simple and easy measure, uh, cost-effective and easy measure. And then I'm just gonna put the other one to you as well at the same time, if you don't mind uh, sort of memorizing both. Short question as well. Anthony Joseph Brogan says that research has shown that plant-based ionizers are effective in significantly reducing aerosols indoors. Is this hybrid approach the way forward? He's wondering. So a couple of thoughts there. I, I like the question about the home and I'll take it beyond COVID. How do we improve indoor quality? First, yeah. let's take the source control. I think we have to do a better job at um, uh, thinking about the products we put in our homes, low VOC, low volatile organic chemicals, uh, thinking about other semi-volatile chemicals like these forever chemicals, if you're not familiar with them, the stain repellent chemicals that actually are associated with a whole health, uh, whole host of adverse health effects. So do a better job in terms of our uh, the source control, switching out natural gas stoves for electric stoves. Natural gas stoves emit a whole host of indoor pollutants that are bad for respiratory health, uh, um, exacerbate asthma. So that's number one. Two, I think some simple things, if you don't have mechanical air, should be opening up the windows as much as we can, increase ventilation rate. So I'm a, I'm a bad um, example here. So my CO2 levels, I have my meter somewhere, you know, generally very high in my, in my office, unless I crack open the window a little bit. We've really tightened up our buildings. Uh, so when you can, when the weather's nice, open up the window, some really simple things. I'll give people a, a tip on that one. My Harvard team wrote a report called Homes for Health. And if you just search on this, uh, look up Harvard Healthy Buildings, Homes for Health. We have 36 expert tips for a healthier home. Kick off your shoes before you walk in the door. Uh, think, uh, ventilating, make sure you're, you're above your stove. You have um, exhaust ventilation, right? So you're, you're capturing these, these pollutants and particles when you cook. Simple things, really written for the public, simple things you can do. So there's a lot we can actually do to improve um, our health, uh, um, especially uh, in our homes. Great. Second question on ionization. I think um, there's a lot of new technologies out there uh, in terms of ionization. I, I, um, I'm usually cautious when it, so I'm not anti-new technology. I'm just cautious. I think we have to evaluate any new technology across these three questions. Does it work? Simple enough. Does it, is it, does it produce any potentially harmful byproducts? And three, what problem is it solving? Is it replacing one of those first four measures because they're not sufficient? 
So the first one, I think on the ionizer question, depends on the technology, depends on the exact tool, but I think there's lots of debate about how effective they are. Two, is it safe? I think the, for me, the idea of releasing anything into the air constantly, whether it be a chemical or ions, um, we have to be careful that we're, we are fundamentally changing the air. You can create secondary pollutants like ultrafine particles, or uh, you, can, you can convert complex VOCs into other VOCs that may be respiratory hazards. So the, is it changing the air and, and is it safe? I think it depends on the technology, how it's deployed and things like this. And third, what's it replacing? So can't we just solve this with better ventilation, better filtration, which we know come with a lot of other benefits. I could talk a lot about plants and biophilic design if that comes up in another question, but I, I would just be, I would think about those questions when you think about new technology, those three questions. Does it work? Is it safe? And also fundamentally, what is it solving that can't be solved through these other methods that have decades of science behind them supporting their benefits? Great. Patrick Kenny um, asks whether you'd comment um, on current US research on impacts of mold and spores on indoor health and how building design can either mitigate or worsen their impacts. Yeah, we've been doing a lot of research there, um, and this is right decades old, uh, old field, but it's one of the nine foundations of a healthy building, thinking about moisture control specifically for that reason. And I think, um, you know, I, I, the, um, the evidence is really clear or, or you know, across the different uh, species of fungi and, and mold, um, the, the, the health concerns or the irritation they can cause. And also, but the control measures there are relatively straightforward, right? If you're monitoring, and, or not monitoring, if you're controlling water damage or respond to water damage, controlling moisture such that you have, you're limiting the conditions for mold growth, that can um, mitigate the problem. Also, if you see it, you remediate. I think the, the remediation uh, is really quite, clear and, and um, uh, the guidance is clear on how to mitigate or remediate if there's a mold issue. One of the areas we've been really interested in, <laughs> we started new research here that I can share maybe next year. Um, uh, we started a new re uh, research funded by the National Science Foundation in the United States looking at water damage and mold and moisture specifically after uh, natural disasters like hurricanes. So what happens when you have an event like we just had Hurricane Ian in the United States that devastated parts of Florida. Uh, and what do you do as people start to reoccupy these places? And now you have severe water damage uh, and, and amongst all the other hazards, uh, you, you, you have the potential and real uh, threat of, of mold growth indoors. So that's where we're moving our research to to think about climate events uh, and these indoor uh, threats. We have a publication here, Health and Safety Review. Um, it's called, and we've got Margaret Kirby uh, from Health and Safety Review asking, just to clarify, uh, what is meant by bringing buildings back to performance standards? Could you explain that further? Yeah, sure. So I quickly talked on like the 100 year history of ventilation rates. So one of the standard setting bodies for ventilation in buildings, let's talk about this, is, is ASH rate. And, and largely um, this gets uh, followed uh, internationally, gets into building codes. ASHRAE, these ventilation standards are named the standards for acceptable indoor air quality. Ventilation for acceptable indoor air quality. That shouldn't be acceptable. We shouldn't be taking bare minimums. I want healthy indoor air quality. In addition, the standards are design standards, not performance standards, such that if I built a building 10 years ago and the design standard says uh, 18, cubic feet per minute per person, nine liters per second per person. So some volume, some amount of air, right? Some number of air changes. So I built my building to that. That became code wherever it is, in Ireland, US, wherever it is. Over time, I don't give my building a tune up. Performance is gonna slip, right? Just like your car performance would slip if you don't give it a tune up. So now you have a design standard that's not designed for health and your building is falling even further below that. Now. Let's take air change per hour to explain this a little bit. Let's take um, classrooms and schools in the US. I've been thinking a lot about schools. Three air changes per hour. Over time, most US schools are now at one and a half air changes per hour, despite the design standard being here and despite the target being four to six. So while I'm very much interested in getting the buildings that are already getting four, five, six air changes even higher and better filtration, the majority of our benefit right now if we, it would be just focusing on those buildings that are chronically underventilated and bringing them back to the way they were designed in the first place. Then we can say, I've given my building a tune up. Now I know it's back to the way it was designed. And what else can I do? Can I bump up ventilation? Can I bump up filtration? Do I need a new fan? 
Do I need to overhaul the system? Maybe it's something simple. And so, but, but all of the, ben most of the benefits gonna come from bringing the poorest performing buildings back to the way they're designed and then go above and beyond. I also like the idea of performance-based standards. I think that's where real-time sensor technology comes in. Because how do you know if your building's slipping? In my book, we call it taking the pulse of the building. So you go to the doctor, right? What's the first thing she does when you, when you walk in? No matter what you're there for, they check your pulse, blood pressure, maybe your weight. So we need to do this for our buildings to say, how do you know if it's slipped from that standard? Well, we have to measure it and think about performance standards that says it's designed one way, but we can measure now with low cost sensors, the indoor air quality performance and make sure it's staying where it should be. And then also target these higher standards. So getting a whole bunch wrapped up in that, the standards are not designed for health. They're performance, they're design standards. We forget about them, they're not performance standard. Uh, and we have the tools and technology to, to do performance-based standards. And can we relate that? Because obviously a lot of people here are thinking right across the world, I'm sure, are thinking about their domestic um, buildings and having them assessed in terms of their uh, sustainability in respect of heat and ventilation and so on. And they're thinking about what they might do to improve that. Um, how do we link this tune up that you're talking about to the sorts of assessments that are done by people and that need that are required to be done for people, for example, who are looking at maybe solar panels or looking at doing something to improve the the um, to improve their homes from that perspective? I mean, should the two be part of the same process or what's your reflection on that? I think they have to be part of the same process and I think they haven't been. So clearly, right, it's a residential uh, where we all spend the vast, vast majority of our time. Um, and maybe even more so now for a lot of people uh, since COVID. So if you think about, so energy, you can have energy efficient improvements to our buildings. So we, um, uh, we mitigate uh, or we put on solar panels. Uh, I'm a, a supporter of the, what's called the electrify everything movement, uh, where we have to get off fossil fuels in our buildings. That improves indoor health. It also improves outdoor health. Uh, so we can, when we make, we have to be making those improvements. Right, and, and we released a paper in the US is showing as the US has moved away from coal fired power plants, the dominant source of health damages in the majority of states in the US is from on site fossil fuel combustion within building fossil fuel combustion. So we're gonna have to do that. And it comes with the health benefit for people indoors, it comes with the climate benefit. And because the dominant emissions are now coming from buildings in a lot of places, it becomes an equity issue. It's a community, it, you're, you're reducing the air pollution emitted in your local community or local region. No longer just regional coal-fired power plants and regional air pollution, localized impacts, real localized impacts. So we have to do all that. Where I think we have to be careful is that sometimes in our green building efforts or our energy efficient efforts, we have tightened up our building envelopes so much that we've stopped letting our buildings breathe. If you look at what happened in the US in the 1970s, global energy crisis in the 1970s, in response, we started to tighten up our buildings, save energy, that mm -hmm. sounds great. It also ushered in the sick building era. That's when that term started to appear, the early 1980s. Well, it makes sense. We had we uh, have products that emit high levels of, uh, uh, of off-gassing the chemicals. We have our gas stoves emitting into the home. And now we're not letting our buildings breathe. You have an end up of uh, uh, buildup of indoor pollutants tied to good and important energy efficiency goals, but they were at odds with each other. But if you look at new technologies that are available, they don't have to be at odds. You can bring in more outdoor air using energy recovery ventilation, for example, where you're retaining the, the, the heated or the cooled air and you're not wasting all that energy. But I don't think we can have a, a future where we say we're going to sacrifice indoor our health indoors for energy efficiency goals. Just like I don't think we say we have a healthy building that doesn't do well for the environment by our energy choices. And there are great examples out there in the residential sector, in the commercial sector. I advised on JP Morgan's new headquarters in Midtown Manhattan, all electric tower, double the ventilation rates. So it's beautifully sustainable, all electric and higher ventilation rates, better filtration, better indoor air quality, real-time indoor air quality monitoring. I think that's really where the future is going. Uh, mm. we, we have to marry these uh, these disciplines that have been at odds for 40 years. And not have 
two really important public imperatives maybe pulling against each other or at least the risk that they are, are seen by people as being in conflict where in truth they're not in conflict at all the opposite is the case actually don lobrolocon um, the iia member of the iia here he says he was asking and you can comment on this but in fact you've touched on it should the installation of mechanical ventilation heat recovery systems be part of public policy for domestic residents as is the case uh, in relation to the installation of heat pumps now? I think absolutely. I think it's a smart comment. Uh, yeah, clearly, right? We have to, have, I love the idea of heat pumps, uh, ground source heat pumps, air source heat pumps, network. We just had a networked ground source heat pumps in Massachusetts. We're piloting. I think there are all, all these clever ideas, but yes, clearly as we do a better job of heating and cooling our buildings, we don't want to waste all that, uh, that energy. So energy recovery ventilation, heat recovery ventilation is just really smart and the technology is ready uh, and it can't be done. Yeah. Two questions I'm going to put to you. Um, they're not related at all, but just because they're short, we can take them together. Peter Murphy wonders whether, I mean, this is a, maybe a, just a rhetorical kind of question that he has, which is fair enough. Do you think that employers are fearful of measuring the indoor air quality of their workplaces? And then Dr. Sean O'Rean asks you directly, is it dangerous to live near a motorway? How far away from a motorway is safe? Uh, two great questions. Okay, so the first one, are employees fearful? Um, I, I said, I think yes, some, some, right? There's some organizations that just want to do well and, and, uh, and they're not fearful. But I'll tell you a quick story about my own field. So I'm a certified industrial hygienist, done this kind of work for decades. I'd say in the past, here's how it's gone. You've had an indoor air quality complaint at a company. You'd hire an expert. They would go take some measurements. It would end up in a report. Sometimes they go to the legal department. We'd never see the light of day, right? Uh, maybe they took corrective action. Maybe they didn't. And, and companies say, well, I'm not sure I want to measure because what if I find something? So mm -hmm. good companies say, I want to find something if it's bad and then fix it. Some mm -hmm. not great companies say, I don't even want to look. Here's a massive shift that's coming where that paradigm is being blown up. The proliferation of these low-cost sensors means that the, the information asymmetry is over. Companies held all that power. Now, if you're not measuring in your building, I'm an employee, I go in, I take my handheld device, I go into your office and I'm telling you what the problem is. Now I'm in control of the data. I'm gonna share it on Glassdoor, on Facebook, on TikTok, whatever it is, social media. I'm gonna say, hey, company X, why aren't you dealing with that indoor air quality? That is a major shift. So the power has shifted. You have a highly knowledgeable public now about indoor air quality because of COVID. And now they have the tools. They don't need a $10,000 scientific instrument anymore. A couple hundred dollars. And that'll keep getting cheaper. So that's really important. I don't think employees and companies can hide anymore from indoor air quality. In fact, I advise them to get on top of it. Start monitoring now so that if somebody comes in with a device that they can manipulate, you can say, well, that's your reading, but we have the whole system over here and we're verifying that air quality is good. That's a better strategy. Good question. Second one about motorways. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of research on distance to roadways. It depends on the distance, um, uh, wind direction, all, all of these factors. But yes, there's a lot of studies showing proximity to roadway is a risk factor for things like asthma or higher or asthma exacerbations. Now, the, the exact, I, don't, I can't give you a, 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 an exact distance, but lots of studies have been done on, on distance and, uh, and particle uh, pollution and, and transport. Let me, let me turn it into a positive though. Even if you are near a roadway, you can design and operate a building such that you minimize that impact. So we say outdoor air pollution penetrates indoors. I opened with that, the dirty secret of outdoor air pollution. But if you use some of these same strategies I talked about that are good for COVID, good ventilation and filtration, now, good ventilation, you still want to bring in outdoor air, but now you have high quality filtration. You're capturing a lot of those air pollutants before they enter the space. And we see this even in, uh, we just finished a global study of indoor air quality uh, and, uh, and buildings. And even in the buildings in China with terrible outdoor air pollution, so not specific to roadways, just places with bad outdoor air pollution, you saw buildings that have good filtration strategies could disentangle that effect meaning outdoor air pollution was high, indoor levels were low, like you'd find in a good building anywhere in the world because they manage ventilation filtration well. 
Now, the opposite was true, too. There were many buildings that didn't manage ventilation filtration, and the indoor pollution levels were really quite high. So similar thing with the roadway thing. I, I leave it on a positive that, yeah, distance to roadway matters, but we can also mitigate that depending on the choices we make in terms of our building strategies. Thank you. Martin McCarthy is wondering about the what, what he describes as the trend uh, for open plan offices. And he says also op open plan dwellings. Um, would Do you think they're generally better or worse for indoor air quality? Yeah, I've seen uh, and there's been uh, a lot of talk about this, a big report recently in the US and the New York Times on this and, and lots of debate with the companies. I, my answer is this. I think like anything, there's good and open, there's good and bad open floor plans, just like there's good and bad closed floor plans. Um, so let's take, but let's get a little more specific. I, I think there's a lot of concern about open floor plans being higher risk for COVID and other infectious diseases. I don't think that's the case. I think it depends on what your ventilation and filtration strategy is. I've, I've worked on and designed open floor plans that are that are great. Um, it could be bad. You could overpack people into a space, high occupant density with poor ventilation. That's going to be a problem from an infectious disease standpoint. I've also seen that happen, but the opposite happen in closed office spaces where, you know, is that the answer where you box everybody back up? Well, in that case, I've seen low ventilation, low filtration, bad lighting, detachment of the core of the building from access to natural light, there's a whole host of other factors that come into it. And I think that conversation on open floor plans has gotten uh, too narrow. It hasn't taken the holistic view. Short answers, I think you could do good open floor plans and bad open floor plans. I don't think there's one straightforward answer, despite I think what people have taken really, really hard line positions on one, you know, being good or bad. I just think it's in the implementation of it, really. And, and controlling these, you know, I'm very much on the, you know, those nine foundations of a healthy building. You control those factors. Um, Th then it's going to be a healthy space. And I think you can do it either way with closed offices or open floor plans. Mm, interesting. Um, I'm going to go back to Patrick Kenny of the EPA, and he's asking you to comment on the US experience of the impacts of different heating systems, in particular solid fuel heating systems on indoor air, especially fine particulate matter concentrations. Well, you know, this is really, it's a great question. And um, you know, even some of the uh, most aggressive and good uh, building energy efficiency laws, like in New York City has local law 97, some of them fail to um, recognize or, or um, legislate against uh, biomass or, uh, or, mm. uh, or wood burning, which has the high, one of the highest emission rate for particulates, which causes, you know, is not, it can be the dominant source of health damages, localized health damage or localized regional uh, health damage from emissions. So um, I think this is critically important. It's well documented that these are these are these have a, a big impact on, on air quality indoors and also a study by my colleague at Harvard Graduate School of Design showing that emissions of the solid fuel burning um, uh, does actually impact air quality, uh, even you know, just uh, neighborhood air quality. So I think it's a big I think it's a big problem and we and we and we so we can make some mistakes here and my co another colleague talks about it this way we can we can choose some carbon neutral fuels you get a renewable biomass right carbon neutral fuels that aren't health neutral i think that would be a mistake right as we think about our renewable energy goals we have to be careful that we're not using something that's uh good for carbon but may cause a health concern so uh yeah, really, that's a really good, uh, really good question. I think a lot of legislation around uh, building energy efficiency sometimes ignores uh, that point. Lydia Frumosa had um, a question earlier, and um, I'm hoping it's clear, and that's not, not a criticism of Lydia. I'm just not sure if when I read it, it makes total sense to me, but hey, what, how would it make sense to me? It probably does make sense to you, so I'll, I'll give it a shot. Uh, she says, we have LEED, LWED certification systems, and there is a credit for indoor air quality. Could you please give examples of best cases in the USA or elsewhere where this is taken, she says, taking, where this is taken beyond construction and indoor air is at the core of the construction? I imagine that the end of that question is really, is, is the core of the question as well. Where, uh, so could you address that? Yeah, it's a great question. So LEED is uh, uh, from the US Green Building Council, but there are uh, global green building standards that are similar, leadership and energy and environmental design. 
uh, really had a you know a 20 year great run. A lot of buildings have the lead plaque on them saying they're energy efficient and absolutely correct. In let's say whatever the, the, the total points that are available, there are some credits and available or points if you uh, if you focus on indoor air quality. I don't think lead goes anywhere near far enough in terms of indoor air quality. So it's mostly energy efficiency. There's some part of indoor air quality. They probably can't have too many points if it's about energy efficiency around indoor air quality. It's the absolute basics. So when I see a lead building, I don't necessarily think it has to be great indoor air quality because you can just score a couple of points on their scoring. Um, I like it for what it's done on the energy efficiency side. That said, there are great examples <clears throat> of companies that have placed uh, health at the core of design uh, for new buildings and even existing buildings. So in the new buildings, I encourage you to look up uh, that JP Morgan uh, headquarters right in Midtown Manhattan, uh, because it focuses on both energy and health and goes way beyond what LEED would have in indoor air quality. In fact, it goes way beyond what um, anybody else is pushing right now in terms of healthy buildings. So there are examples like that. And there's examples on residential. There's also great examples on improving um, uh, existing buildings. So I work with a lot of big multinational companies, names you would know, that are overhauling their entire portfolio. First, benchmarking. What does my portfolio look like in terms of indoor air quality? I don't mean a handful of lead credits. I mean, all around the nine foundations of a healthy building, whatever other score or whatever system you want to use or whatever reference you want to use, but basically saying, let's do a deep dive on lighting, water quality, biophilic design, acoustics, indoor air quality, ventilation, filtration, the whole thing, go deep and say, well, what are the current standards but really, what is the science saying we should be doing right now? So going well beyond standards. And in that case, you see um, entire portfolios being redesigned around new healthy building uh, standards or retrofitted to new healthy building standards. Um, so I think LEED is maybe a good starting point. I give them credit for acknowledging indoor air quality 20 years ago when LEED started really uh, uh, grow. But I don't think it's nearly far enough. I don't think it's comprehensive. And I wouldn't use it as the basis to say, hey, I, I did lead in my building. I have, you know, leading class indoor air quality. It's a good starting point, but that's where, that's where, that's it. It's a starting point. So there's been quite a few questions about asking you that you've dealt with already, asking you about best practice in the U.S. and so on. And you've been very generous in terms of saying, you know, there, there is information available. There are resources there much of which you have been responsible for yourself and you know the, the book and various other sources of information you mentioned some buildings even high profile market kirby kind of came back on that point and I, I feel a little bad that we may have curtailed you a little bit too much when you were doing your slides and i'm wondering because margaret is wondering what can companies do in relation to the four strategies mentioned in the slides and, and you know she was wondering could you give examples in relation to the four i, I imagine you'll say look you can pursue that further. I, I, I mean, if you can give any examples in relation to four strategies, please do. We're probably coming up on, on time now, but where would people go to look for more detail on those four strategies? Yeah, yeah. So I'll give you, so you can look at our Lancet COVID-19 Commission, Task yeah. Force on Safe Work, Safe School. But I'll, let me just do it quickly because it'll give you some resources. So that first one, right? It's called commissioning your building or giving it a tune-up. So you want to look for a local engineering firm, HVAC contractor, and tell them you want to commission your systems, do continuous commissioning which means they go out there and they check to make sure it's working. Are the filters installed right? Are there any fans uh, burned out? Just, just making sure your building's performing. And here's how we know it works. There's a great study at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab in the US showing that it saves money, improves indoor air quality. So it's actually gonna, it's a process that's gonna save you money. And it's the baseline, it establishes, it lets you know what your systems are currently doing. And you ask that same contractor, how can I improve it? So look for a good uh, HVAC contractor, environmental engineering firm. Uh, as that starting point. Other basics, increasing ventilation. That could be opening up the windows, increasing uh, the amount of airflow into your space. On filtration, number three, minimum standard right now should be MERV 13 filters. Most buildings have a MERV 8. Captures about 20% of particles. The way I describe it is that a MERV 8 filter is designed to protect the equipment, not people. A MERV 13 uh, filter designed to protect people. Captures 80, 90% of airborne particles. That's particles from outdoor air pollution, from roadway, or particles mm -hmm. generated by a respiratory system. So upgrade to MERV 13 filters. Fourth one, portable air cleaners, simple portable air cleaners. I'll give you a rule of thumb. Look for one with a good HEPA filter and what's called a clean air delivery rate. My rule of thumb, look for a clean air delivery rate, CADR, of 300 for every 500 square feet. They got to convert that to meters for me. 
300 CADR for every 500 square feet of space. We'll give you between four and six air changes per hour. So really simple strategies. I hope that sounded simple. If it is, that report is really short. Lots of guidance out there. And the book goes into a lot more detail around all the nine foundations of a healthy building if you're thinking about what my recommendations are for ventilation or lighting, acoustics, these other factors. Um, I was astonished at what you said about the majority of the exposure to outdoor pollution occurs indoors. Um, I suppose when you, when, you, when you think about it, perhaps we shouldn't be as astonished because it, 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 there's a logic to that. But still, it was quite a stark statement that you made at the outset. Um, and it's interesting. And so going from business to the back to the domestic, Keelan O'Sullivan, um, who's a researcher here at the IIEA, points out that Ireland is one of the highest rates of asthma prevalence in the world, um, the most common chronic disease affecting children and the most common chronic respiratory disease in adults. So wondering again, how can, and we're coming up on the hour, but how can Irish people manage their indoor spaces to reduce asthma triggers? Yeah, I think that's, uh, it's a, that's a big question. I mean, and I, but, I, but there are a handful of things. And I'll go back to the source control, right? There's a whole bunch of asthma triggers, outdoor air pollution, allergens and dust in the home, right? So managing dust and allergens and uh, cockroach allergens, mouse allergens, things that are all around us all the time can be triggers. We have indoor triggers like gas stoves that trigger asthma or exacerbate asthma. We have the penetration of outdoor pollutants inside. So I actually think, all right, let's take it on the, this big level uh, question. So improve our climate goals, we want to electrify everything, remove fossil fuel combustion indoors. That's going to help against asthma, definitely. Do a better job with our material selection, lower chemical loads, avoiding some of these asthmogens uh, that are in the space, better cleaning with HEPA filters, control the dust level and the allergen loading, improve filtration, the same portable air cleaners, that uh, reduce uh, particles. So that as the particles penetrate from indoors, these particles that we know are associated with asthma, uh, you reduce that concentration. And of course, big picture, we continue our push, our climate goal push of, um, of cleaning the energy grid because a major source of outdoor air pollution, a major source of mortality and asthma and everything else are coming from these, um, uh, you know, from uh, coal fired power plants, natural gas power plants. We need to continue our push uh, to reduce fossil fuels for the climate goals, long-term health benefits, but it provides immediate benefits. It provides immediate benefits in terms of better health, including reductions in asthma uh, for kids and adults. Yeah. And isn't that, just to finish up, is, isn't that a really rich um, source of um, kind of public policy and public and encouragement of, of conduct where we can say, look, when we're talking about the climate agenda and pressing for rapid change in that in that on that agenda that we, we can isn't there a need to communicate more perhaps to people that there's also a gain an immediate gain in terms of things like air quality and i know that's something that you know governments try to do because the communication of so much of what needs to be done on the climate agenda has gotten potentially negative connotations to it you've got to stop this you've got to stop you know you must you change your lifestyle no more turf no more no more coal obviously no more oil you you, you know you've got to you've got to change things around and it's a long term people think well that's maybe if i can do it i will if i can afford it i will but it's going to take investment but shouldn't part of and we'll finish on this and you said it really but just to emphasize it part of the communication of what needs to be done on the climate agenda really needs to fold in um, much more clearly to the immediate gains that people get in their daily lives in relation to something like air quality. I think that's exactly right. And I'll end it really quickly. And we make this case in the book. But we want to improve conditions of everyone's health. We want to uh, act on climate. It's also just good for our health in the immediate. And it's just good business. If you're a business owner out there, I co-authored my book with, Harvard, with a Harvard Business School professor, John McCumber, for a reason. These things are just good business. To help us think better, we're more productive, it reduces asthma attacks, yes, while addressing the long-term challenges of climate change uh, and helps against COVID and whatever, whatever else threat comes. It's just, it, it's a really a win-win on all levels. It's good economically, good financially, good for climate, good for immediate health. So that framing is exactly right. There are immediate benefits and we can act selfishly for our own health, our own business. At the same time, we'll actually be helping collectively and acting for everybody at the same time. We can have it all. Thank you so much. I want to thank um, Joseph Allen, Professor Joseph Allen, for joining us this afternoon here on this webinar. It's been most interesting and stimulating. I think we could go for another hour. We've done so much interest in it.
and particularly that point towards the end, how we integrate these, you know, different imperatives that we have in terms of public policy. But your concentration on buildings, um, it's just the points are just so well made um, this afternoon. I want to thank you for that. Again, thank the colleagues at the Environmental Protection Agency for sponsoring uh, uh, and supporting this event. And thank you for uh, joining us, uh, if you have been, and many of you have, for the last hour. And we'll see you all again before too long. Thank you very much.